Let's start off with our experiments and learning about sample spaces. Say we have a ball with a diameter of 2. And we draw a dot on it. We roll the ball on the ground. When the ball stops, we observe the outcome, which is the 3D location of the dot relative to the ball itself. To consistently determine this 3D location, we place a box over the ball. Let's roll it one more time. Where do you think the dot will end up? I'm sure you did not guess the correct location exactly. In fact, it is not possible to predict the next outcome with certainty. What do you think are all the possible 3D locations for the dot when the ball stops? Have a think about this. To work this out, imagine that the ball is rolled many, many times. Theoretically, the dots will end up covering an infinite number of possible positions on the sphere. This infinite number of all possible positions or outcomes is what we define as our sample space. The surface of our hollow sphere represents our sample space. Did you notice over time that pattern emerged? Probably not. You can see that the number of dots appearing on the front of the ball is about the same as the number of dots on the back of the ball. This is exactly our definition of randomness. Each outcome is not predictable in advance. However, there is a predictable long-term pattern that can be described by the distribution of the outcomes of many, many trials. In the previous experiment, we can measure many different characteristics. We could look at the angle, or we could look at the height. For instance, to this random outcome, we assign the numerical value 0 0.53. Now, let's plot the value 0 0.53 on the line. Let's roll one more time. What do you think the next value will be? We'll give you five seconds to write it down. This time, the height is 0 0.74. Let's plot this value on the line as well. What are all the possible values of height one can get? We'll give you 5 seconds to write it down. Let's go back to our sample space. As you can see, you can have a height of 0 when the dot is on the ground, all the way to a height of 2 when the dot is at the top of the ball. Therefore, in this example, the dot's height can be potentially any value in the interval 0 to 2. Now we have added 0 and 2 to our line for our random variable h, the height of the dot. A random variable is an assignment of a numerical value to each possible outcome of a random phenomenon. Since there is a continuum of possible values, our random variable h, the height of the dot, is called continuous. Do you think that some ranges of values are more probable than others? How can we figure this out? Let's start by adding the frequency on the vertical axis. 
In this case, we will divide the horizontal axis into 10 bins, also known as cells, each with a width of 0.2. As you can see, in bins 3 and bin 4, there is a frequency of 1, because the dot's height with values in these bins has occurred once in our experiment so far. What happens when we do this experiment 30 times? Well, we now have enough data to create a histogram. This long-term pattern in this ball experiment shows that the density of points in each bin is different. How densely packed are the points in the various bins? Denseness usually refers to a measure of how much of some entity is within a fixed amount of space. Imagine we have three bins. The first bin has a few scrunched up papers in it. The second bin has about five times as much paper in it. And the third one has 500 times more paper in it compared to the first bin, all squashed into a bin of exactly the same size. The second bin has a higher density than the first bin, while the third bin is much, much more densely packed than the other two. So what happens to this histogram when we do the experiment 10,000 times? This time, we will change the aspect of our histogram by using 100 bins, each with a width of 0.02. As you can see, with more and more repetitions, the pattern becomes much more obvious. What does this mean for the density? To mathematically determine the density of points in a bin, we take the proportion of dots in that bin. Let's say the bin from here where the frequency is 125. And divide it by the bin width, which is 0.02. In this case, we end up with the density of 0.625. What happens to the histogram when we do this to all of the bins? We get a graph that looks like this. What do you notice? It has exactly the same shape as our other graph. Did you also notice that the values on the vertical axis have changed and that the units are now densities? Now, Think about what would happen if you had many, many bins and more and more points to add from your experiment. You can see the bins getting narrower and narrower and the pattern becoming sharper and sharper. Eventually, you would end up with a very smooth representation. The border of this shape is called a density curve. This density curve can also be defined mathematically. So what does this all mean for our ball rolling experiment? If we turn the graph on its side, it starts to make more sense. The total area under this curve is equal to 1. The probability of a dot appearing in any given shaded region on the sphere is exactly equal to the area of the corresponding shaded extent of surface under the density curve. So what does this mean in the real world? This means that if you know what the density curve is for a real-world experiment, then you can compute the probability of any event related to that experiment. For example, there are density curves for things ranging from birth weights <coughs> to survival after heart transplants to the waiting time for the next bus, and even for geyser eruptions. 